Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the third installment of Delaware Mini Medical School done virtually this year due to the pandemic. And uh, we might just continue doing it this way because we've got larger classes than ever. Uh, just to remind, this is a partnership of the Delaware Academy of Medicine, Delaware Public Health Association, and Christiana Care. Uh, my name is Tim Gibbs, and I'll be along with uh, Dr. Kate Smith in the background, your host for this evening. Uh, Dr. Smith did uh, ask me to let you all know, we, we understand that some of you experienced some difficulty uh, last week with the new way we had you logging in. Our apologies for that. It was an experiment that did not go well. At 8.45, doctors, after this evening's uh, session, Dr. Smith will be sending out a survey that you'll need to promptly uh, reply to and complete uh, to get your credit for attending this evening's class. Dr. Smith, give me a head nod if I covered everything of a great importance, great. And then uh, I'm sharing a screen right now with the Minimed website and you will see that last week's uh, presentation uh, from Tim Bowers is now up. So you've got the video, you've got the PowerPoint slide deck and then a web link this time to some additional resources about COVID-19 and clinical trials. So I will stop sharing that. Um, Tim, the other thing is the questions for tonight. We're going to hold uh, them until yes. the end. So you can ask questions in the chat, but our presenter is going to hold all questions and then answer them at the end to make sure that he can get through everything he wants to talk about tonight. Right, exactly. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So uh, this evening, uh, we're honored to have uh, Mihir Shah, MD, uh, joining us uh, so frequently in many medical school over the years, we have focused uh, necessarily importantly and appropriately about women's health issues, but every once in a while we like to uh, throw in something that is uniquely a man's health issue. And so for the sisters and the daughters and the mothers and the, the wives and significant others uh, who are on, hope you get something out of this uh, that you can then uh, transfer over to the male or males in your household. Dr. Shaw is a fellowship trained in uh, trained neurologist specializing in minimally invasive urologic surgery. He joined Christiana Care after completing a prestigious fellowship in advanced robotics, laparoscopy, and urologic oncology at the University of South Carolina Institute of Urology in Los Angeles, California. I have a feeling I said something wrong. Southern California, excuse me. Dr. Shaw completed his urology residency at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and served as chief resident in his final year of training. He received his medical degree from Rutgers University, New Jersey Medical School in Newark, New Jersey. He graduated magna cum laude in bachelor's of science in biomedical engineering from Rutgers University in New Brunswick and he was a merit scholar and inducted into the honors engineering program during his time there. Dr. Shah has a fellowship training in complex robotic approaches for the management of malignant and benign neurological diseases. During his fellowship at USC, he had the opportunity to learn from some of the most experienced and world-renowned robotic surgeons, including Dr. Inderber Gill, a pioneer in the field of robotic and laparoscopic neurologic surgery. Under their guidance, Dr. Shaw was able to learn some of the most cutting edge techniques in minimal, minimally invasive urologic surgery. Dr. Shaw's extensive experience and particular interest in the management of urological cancers, so that would be kidney, prostate, bladder, ureter, adrenal glands, penis and testes, kidney stones, benign metastatic, metastatic hyperplasia, and urinary fistula. His training in robotic surgery allows him to perform the operation through small incisions, leading to less post-operative pain, shorter hospital stay, and faster overall recovery from surgery. I will now turn it over to Dr. Shaw. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Dr. Smith. Thanks for having me today. I'm going to share my screen and just bear with me for a sec. Tim, you might have to stop yeah. sharing yours first. OK. 
Okay. I will assume that everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can. And we will get started. Um, okay. Thank you for that introduction, Tim. And um, I, I decided to focus today's talk on prostate health and uh, include two large topics that a lot of men encounter through their life. That would be benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH and prostate cancer. So let's get into it. Again, I will cover the anatomy of the prostate gland. Uh, what is BPH, how to evaluate and how to manage it, and what is prostate cancer, and how do we evaluate and manage prostate cancer. The prostate gland is about a walnut-sized gland uh, that secretes fluid that is part of the seminal uh, fluid that is in the ejaculate, and it is located between the bladder uh, and the urethra. It has several zones and these come into play because of the location of where most of the cancers occur uh, versus where the benign prosthetic hyperplasia occurs. Most of the cancer occurs in the periphery or on the outer side of the prostate. And most of the benign overgrowth is in the central part of the prostate, which is where it can narrow the outlet through the urethra as the uh, when the bladder empties, the urine courses through the urethra, which tra travels through the prostate and out through the rest of the urethra. So what is BPH? Uh, BPH is a benign uh, enlargement of the prostate gland. It is extremely common and occurs with aging in all men. Roughly 50% of all men by the time they're 50 years old have some degree of BPH. And by the time men get to 80 years old, 90% of them have BPH. So this is a common story that I hear on a daily basis in the office. Uh, the patient is 65, he has a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, and he comes to my clinic complaining of new bothersome urinary symptoms that have started several months ago and have progressively worsened. Most common complaint for him is his stream has gotten much weaker. It's not like I, it used to be when I was 20 doc, you hear that all the time. Uh, he's going to urinate much more frequently. He's waking up three times a night when prior it was only once a night. And then he notes that when he has the sensation that he has to go, he really has to rush, that he can't hold it. He doesn't think he can make it otherwise. And so these are, the most common symptoms of BPH. Men will complain of a weak stream. They will complain of going much more frequently. They no longer can hold their urine. It's always a rush. They have to often push or strain to get the urine out. They sometimes feel as though the bladder is not completely empty when they're done. They wake up several times a night to urinate. The stream can take longer to start. Some men will respond and complain, say, doc, I have to turn the faucet on in the toilet every time I have to go or else I can't start my stream. And they may also complain that the stream starts and stops a lot. And some will complain that at the end, there's a lot of dribbling. Doc, I zipped up my pants and I had a few drops sneak out onto my underpants. And all of these symptoms are extremely bothersome for a lot of men. So how do we evaluate for BPH? A good physical exam and history are the founding uh, base on which everything else is built upon. There is something called IPSS or International Prostatic Symptom Score. This is a validated questionnaire where patients respond to several questions that ask them to describe their urinary symptoms and how bothersome they are. And this gives us a way to compare uh, across encounters for the same patient, but also across patients. There is a non-invasive test called the Euro flow. Uh, and then we can check how much is left behind in their bladder or PVR, which is a post void residual with an ultrasound. The Euro flow machine is non-invasive. They urinate into a specific canister, which can measure the velocity of their flow. And if there's below uh, a cutoff of 10, it is very 
consistent with what we call bladder outlet obstruction, which is in most cases caused by BPH. There's cystoscopy where we can evaluate the anatomy of the prostate, as well as an ultrasound, which gives us again, a good idea of how large their prostate is. So here is a IPSS score, and it will ask these questions, like how often do you feel like you're, you can't empty your bladder completely? And when they fill this out based on the grand total here, you get a symptom score of one through seven or eight through 19 or over 20. And that can categorize them into the severity of their disease. Here is the Euroflow, uh, which generates a, a graph for us. And the bell curve here is what a normal flow looks like. When a stream starts, it quickly gains velocity. And as the bladder starts to empty, the velocity slowly tapers. What you see with this flatter curve is that it never really peaks and it takes much longer. And so this patient has what we call an obstructive voiding pattern where their velocity never gets above 10 and 10 is the cutoff. And it takes much longer for them to empty their bladder. Cystoscopy is a minimally invasive endoscopic technique where we put a soft telescope uh, with has a camera at the end through the channel where men pee from and we can look inside their bladder and look at how the prostates look. And here is an endoscopic view that we see for enlarged prostates on cystoscopy. What you see here is two enlarged prostatic lobes touching itself. While this is abnormal, the normal view would look quite different where the prostatic lobes would be separate and you could see into the bladder from where this telescope is here. So this again gives us a clue that this patient has a very enlarged prostate. So I just told you almost all of the men by the time they get to 80 have BPH. Does that mean we treat every man by the time they get to 80? No, it all comes down to how bothered they are by their symptoms. I see several men that have a very enlarged prostate by volume and size, but they are not bothered by their symptoms and they have minimal symptoms. Those men don't necessarily need treatment. And then there is a few men that have a prostate that's marginally enlarged by size, but have severe symptoms. And so the key question to ask is how bothered are they? And if they are bothered, treatment would be indicated and would be of benefit. Additionally, we need to assess how at risk they are for significant damage to their bladders and or kidneys. If BPH is undiagnosed and progresses into a severe case, some men may not be able to urinate at all. That's a problem because they would need to come into the emergency room. You have to place a catheter, empty their bladder, et cetera. If this goes unrecognized and their bladder does not empty well, they can develop bilateral hydronephrosis or urine backing up into their kidneys. And prolonged hydronephrosis or poor drainage of the kidneys can lead to overall deterioration of their kidney function. Additionally, if the bladder doesn't empty due to a large prostate, these patients are at risk of recurrent urinary tract infections or bladder stones. And what we want to do is prevent the men from getting to this end stage or severe progressive disease state. So what are the medical uh, treatment options? There is two large category of medications that can be used to treat an enlarged prostate. The first category of medications is alpha blocker. The most common medication that we use that are alpha blockers are tamsulosin or Flomax. This, uh, these are the generic names and this is the brand name. Doxazosin, alfuzosin, psilocin, terazosin, or prazosin. All of these are alpha blockers. The way they work is they relax the smooth muscles that line the bladder neck and the prostate. And by relaxation of these musculature, men tend to empty their bladders better. However, these drugs have some side effects. Though the alpha blockers are pretty well tolerated, 
as most of these side effects are not that common and fairly benign. The, one of the biggest ones that we deal with a lot is dizziness or lightheadedness. This occurs because alpha blockers can lower the patient's blood pressure. So if you have an older patient who's on other antihypertensives or blood pressure medications, when you add an alpha blocker for their BPH, they can sometimes have significant lowering of their blood pressure, which then in turn causes lightheadedness or dizziness. Some men will complain of retrograde ejaculation. This is where uh, when they ejaculate, not as much semen comes out. And that's because typically upon ejaculation, the bladder neck, which is the junction of the prostate and the bladder, pinches closed so that all of that fluid that's emitted into the urethra is pushed forward and out through the meatus. However, due to the medication, the bladder neck is often relaxed and it cannot close itself completely. And some of this fluid ends up going back into the bladder and the patient empties their bladder out next time they urinate and that has the semen come out. There's nothing pathologic or uh, worrisome about this, but some men will complain that they don't have as much seminal fluid in their ejaculate. The other side effects are rhinitis or floppy iris syndrome, which is very rare and is, uh, occurs if these patients remain on alpha blockers prior to cataract surgery and the ophthalmologist is not aware of that. The second category of medications that we use for BPH is 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. There's two of these, finasteride and dutasteride. Both of these medications block the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone which in turn causes reduction in the prostate volume by 15 to 30%. And it also reduces the PSA by about 50%. And due to the reduction in volume, these men will have relief with their urinary symptoms. However, this medication takes up to six months to work. It needs, um, it's a very slow onset. And so uh, men that start this medication won't know if they're going to benefit for six months. These medications are not as well tolerated as the alpha blockers due to their significant side effects. And though these side effects are not that common when they occur, they're very bothersome to the patient, especially our younger men. Um, they do not like the side effect of decreased libido or ED. And as you can tell, six to eight percent is not a very small number. Um, it does not cause the retrograde ejaculation that the alpha blockers do. However, it can cause gynecomastia, breast tenderness, fatigue. Um, and occasionally in our older patients that have been on these medications chronically, it can also cause anxiety and depression. And rarely some of these side effects do not reverse when we stop the medications. So due to this uh, set of side effects, a lot of men uh, stay away from these medications uh, in addition to the fact that it may take six months for them to even know if they will, they will have any benefit. For men that do not respond sufficiently to medications or have significant bothersome symptoms despite the medications or cannot tolerate the medications due to side effects or, or simply do not comply well uh, and don't remember to take their medications daily, there's a whole host of surgical treatment options. Back probably 20, 30 years ago, the only option these men had was a transurethral resection of the prostate or an open simple prostatectomy. Over the course of the last couple of decades, we have really come along and there have been numerous minimally invasive procedures for these men that work very well uh, and have much less side effects than the traditional TERP or the open simple prostatectomy. The procedures on the left are some of the ones that I offer here at Christiana to my patients. However, there is additional newer technologies or not newer, new technologies, resume and aqua ablation uh, that um, are not available here at Christiana, but we're hopeful in the near future, we may be able to offer those as well. Some of my partners offer the green light laser TERP, and so we can certainly do that as well. What is the TERP? Transurethral resection of the prostate is an endoscopic technique where we place a larger telescope through the urethra into the prostate 
And this is a schematic where we show you using a cautery, we can shave down the overgrowth of the prostate so that the, the blockage is re relieved and the channel is open. So we do not remove the whole prostate gland. We just shave down the channel where there's the overgrowth. So you have a, uh, you, you uh, unobstruct the bladder. Urolift is a newer technique. Um, this uses a uh, sort of a staple um, device where through the urethra again, we implant a small uh, staple or tack like uh, implant, which mechanically pulls the two lobes apart. And we place about four to six of these, again, opening the channel and relieving the obstruction. Homeum laser enucleation is a uh, more advanced technique that not all providers are able to offer. It requires advanced training. Um, and what this entails is to use a homeum laser to enucleate or remove the entire obstructive component of the prostate. And the pro uh, laser allows for better hemostasis or less bleeding relative to the transurethral resection of the prostate. And it, it has shown to last longer with regards to outcomes and relief of symptoms than the TERP, as most of the time you can unobstruct or remove more tissue than you would with a traditional TERP. And finally, for some of the very large prostates, there is the robotic simple prostatectomy. This entails the da Vinci uh, robotic device, uh, which is made by Intuitive, and we make centimeter or smaller incisions, four or five across the abdomen. We put long laparoscopic instruments, which then connect to this console. And uh, the surgeon will control all of these arms, robotic arms, through uh, these handheld almost joysticks and some foot pedals. And the approach for this is transabdominal. We open the bladder and enucleate the prostate in an anti-grade fashion. The benefit of doing using this technique, again, is less bleeding uh, than the TERP. It also works much better uh, for a very large size prostate because TERP, you're limited by your time. You can only really work for an hour. And so often it's, it, you can shave it down some, but not significantly enough for the very large glands. Now, I've been talking about size and to give you guys uh, some perspective, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, Average size of the prostate for men should be about 20 to 30 grams. When these patients have enlarged prostates, they can vary in size from 40, 50, 60 grams to upwards of 200, 300 grams. So you can see there could be a wide, wide range. So what does the before and after look like? And here are some representative pictures. So the Eurolift, when you talk about those implants, this is an example of a patient that had obstructing lateral lobes and upon completion of the procedure had a wide open prosthetic fossa. So here you can see what I was alluding to before. You should be able to see in, into the bladder here. Uh, this is a resume procedure. Again, at the completion, it's fossa is open. And lastly, the aqua ablation. Again, same result. And so this is to mechanically unobstruct the, the component of the prostate that's blocking the channel. So the take home message here is that BPH is very common, um, but it's a benign condition and it increases in incidence as men get older. They cause bothers, it causes bothersome urinary symptoms that we just discussed earlier. And if patients have these symptoms and are bothered, they would benefit from treatment and they should talk to their primary care provider or a urologist. But if they are not bothered uh, by their urinary symptoms, they don't necessarily need treatment. And finally, there's a, a, a long list of options for these patients uh, that include medications and minimally invasive techniques that can help relieve their symptoms and prevent progression of their disease. With that, we're gonna change gears. And if you guys don't know yet, uh, all of these men, uh, what they have in common is that they're all, they've all been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so what is prostate cancer? It's the abnormal 
growth of cells within the prostate gland. And these cells are out of control with their growth. Uh, there is normal regulatory mechanisms within a cell uh, in any organ in our bodies. And when those mechanisms fail to work, cancer develops and these cells grow out of control. Now, uh, typically these cells initially begin by overgrowth or growing out of control within the prostate, but if undiagnosed or uh, there's a delay in diagnosis, they can spread to other organs through lymph nodes uh, and can cause deposits into organs such as the bones. Of note, it is the most common cancer in men in the United States. Why does it matter? Well, because one in nine men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their life. If you're African-American, your chances are one in six. So it's much more common. And if you have family history, father, brother, who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, the risk is even greater, 20%, one in five. In 2019, 170,000 men in the United States were diagnosed with prostate cancer and roughly 30,000 men died from the disease that year. So prostate cancer in the early stages causes absolutely no symptoms. And that's because I had alluded to it before, the cancer occurs in the peripheral zone or on the, the sort of the, the outside edges of the gland. And in that area, it doesn't really, it's not large enough to cause pain. It doesn't cause any urinary symptoms because that would need for it to be more central like BPH. And so a lot of times prior to the development of screening techniques, men were presenting with advanced metastatic disease because they were presenting with symptoms. And the benefit of screening is to be able to identify men with significant prostate cancer before they develop symptoms and before they have advanced disease. So screening for prostate cancer involves a digital rectal exam that's to examine the prostate as the rectum is right adjacent to the prostate. And therefore a rectal exam allows us to palpate the peripheral zone of the prostate and look for, feel for any nodules. And the second component for screening is called uh, a blood test by the name of PSA. It's called prostate specific antigen. PSA is a reproductive protein that's produced by the prostate gland. And its goal is for seminal vesicle liquefaction, uh, fluid liquefaction. So it basically plays a role in um, the ejaculate fluid. However, the test is not specific to cancer. The PSA can be high in a patient if they have any inflammation in the prostate gland, infection, trauma, or simply just have a benign overgrowth of the gland. And therefore it's challenging to, to be able to identify some of these men and PSA alone is not a good way to do it. Um, we also know that some men that have prostate cancer, about 15% of them may have low or normal PSAs. By lab value range, the normal PSA is between zero to four. And so anything above that is abnormal. But just because it's above four doesn't necessarily mean the patient has prostate cancer. It could simply be one of these more benign conditions that are causing uh, the increase in the PSA. So who should be screened for prostate cancer? Well, it really comes down to the man's age and his risk for prostate cancer. It's very important that we note that benefits of prostate cancer screening come into play when there's at least a 10 year life expectancy. So if a patient is young in their fifties, let's say, but they have a lot of other comorbidities, you know, liver failure or kidney failure, or have had numerous strokes or a heart attack, if their life expectancy is not at least 10 years, they probably should not be screened for prostate cancer. And in the same token, patient may be 70, but they're in excellent health and have no competing medical problems, it, it may be a benefit 
for those men to be selectively screened for prostate cancer. Now, to define the patient's risk for getting prostate cancer, we must know that if they're African-American, they are at a higher risk. If you have a family history, brother, father, you should be screened for prostate cancer. Your risk is about 20%. And most recently, studies have shown that there are several gene mutations, such as the BRCA mutation, which I think some of us may be familiar with, is, a, is the uh, genetic mutation that is commonly linked to breast cancer and runs in, in families that have significant breast cancer history. If men have such genetic mutations in their families, they are at increased risk for prostate cancer. The current AUA screening recommendations for prostate cancer are as follows. For any man under the age of 40, screening is not recommended. That does not matter if they're at high risk or not. If you're between 40 and 55, if you are at average risk, as in you are not a high risk patient, you do not need to undergo screening for prostate cancer. If you are at high risk, defined by the three categories we just discussed, they, these patients should talk to their doctor and consider getting screened. Men between the ages of 55 and 69 should all be screened for prostate cancer after discussion of pros and cons of screening with their doctor. And finally, men above 70 are typically not advised to undergo screening unless there's a select few cases where the patient's extremely healthy, has no other comorbidities, and after a lengthy discussion with their provider, wants to have prostate cancer screening, only then should they, only then they should be screened. So with regards to diagnosing prostate cancer, besides the PSA and the rectal exam, the, the next step, if you are concerned for a patient who has an abnormal digital rectal exam or has at least two subsequent PSA results that are abnormal or elevated, the next step would be to get tissue from the prostate gland to see if there's true cancer. Traditionally, we used to simply do a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy of the prostate. An ultrasound probe would go into the rectum, a small core needle would then be placed into the prostate and tiny samples would be taken. More recently, we have improved our diagnostics and with the addition of MRI, we can now perform what is called an MRI fusion biopsy of the prostate. Here you see the MRI imaging and MRI is much more sensitive and specific in identifying lesions within the prostate with abnormal signaling that are likely to harbor cancer. And it is much better at detecting these areas than the ultrasound. But the benefit now is that we can fuse the images that we obtain from the MRI, which is done pre or before the procedure, and then superimpose them onto the ultrasound while we're doing the, the biopsy. And what this allows us to do, and here is a sample, the yellow line is where the needle would go. And what it allows us to do is to target or place our biopsies directly into the areas that are most suspicious for harboring the cancer. And what MRI fusion biopsies have done is that it has improved our detection of prostate cancer, of clinically significant prostate cancer, and decreased our detection of clinically insignificant prostate cancer. And what is significant, what is insignificant, we'll get into that in a second. Now, when you do a biopsy and you send the biopsy cores off to the pathologist, they look under the microscope and look for how abnormal the glandular cells look. And based on the abnormality and how neoplastic they look, they grade them and give it a score from one through five. Five and four are high risk prostate cancer, two and three are intermediate risk, and one is low risk. Now, some of you may have heard Gleason score. That's the older way of, of 
categorizing these abnormalities. It's more complex. It involves two numbers. But we have transitioned away from that and moved to a newer uh, grading system, which is grade groupings, one through five. And it has simplified it. Um, as I just went through it, there's one five being the highest risk, one being low risk. So in addition to looking at the biopsy results or grade groupings, we take into account the PSA value as well as the rectal exam. And based on the combination of all of those three, patients get categorized into very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And this is really helpful to be able to counsel the patient regarding their prognosis, but also treatment recommendations. Uh, what we've learned through the years is that patients with very low risk and even low risk may not necessarily need treatment for this cancer. Prostate cancer is extremely slow growing. And uh, a lot of men, when we did uh, analysis of postmortem, um, about 30% of men that died into their 80s from natural causes had some low grade or low risk prostate cancer, but that was not what caused their death. And so what we've learned is this very low risk and low risk disease is more indolent and may not necessarily need treatment. And our goal as a urologic, urologic community is to decrease even detection of very low risk or low risk cancer because telling a patient they have cancer and then telling them, well, we don't need to do anything, uh, is not ideal. It causes a lot of anxiety and stress in patients. And they ultimately, a lot of them elect for treatment simply based on those, uh, those reasons. Um, but all treatment has some side effects. And so the MRI has helped us decrease the detection of very low and low risk cancers and increase our detection of meaningful and clinically significant cancers, which are the intermediate and the high risk cancers. So what is the treatment options? Well, it depends if the cancer is contained within the prostate or is it beyond and has spread to other organs. But most of the time with screening, we have been able to detect cancers while they're still contained within the prostate. And what that does is that we can then treat these patients with, a, with an intent to cure them or rid them completely of their cancer. And when we find low risk prostate cancer, like I alluded to, uh, treatment may not be needed. And so the gold standard is active surveillance. And active surveillance involves very, keeping a very close eye on these patients with PSAs, rectal exams, and annual biopsies. And for intermediate risk prostate cancer and high risk prostate cancer, the gold standard treatment is either surgery or radiation. Now, if you have high risk, if you choose radiation, you may need hormone therapy in addition. And if you have intermediate risk and it's very low volume, as in only, let's say, one out of the 12 biopsy specimens came back positive for any cancer. And in those select cases, active surveillance may be an option. But as a general rule, the gold standard of treatment to cure you of your cancer when it's localized to the prostate is either radiation or surgery. I, I alluded to this before but active surveillance simply means keeping a very close eye on the cancer. And it's a combination of PSA tests, digital rectal exams, and biopsies. The benefit of this is that we're avoiding over-treatment and avoiding the side effects of treatment. And both surgery and radiation have some long-term side effects. The most common being trouble with urination and or incontinence or erectile dysfunction. And so the benefit of active surveillance would be to mitigate or avoid any and all of those risks. Now, surgery uh, has been mostly done robotically. 90% um, of these cases in the country are now done robotically. It causes less bleeding, less pain post-op, a faster recovery, shorter hospital stay, and yet the same cancer control. And so we've really transitioned away from making an old fashioned incision to do these surgeries. Radiation uh, can be delivered in various ways. You may hear about brachytherapy, 
external beam radiation with proton beam or cyber knife or uh, image guided radiotherapy or stereotactic radiotherapy. They are all just various ways to deliver this radiation to the patient. Uh, the side effects of radiation include uh, slow development of erectile dysfunction or difficulty with urination. It can also cause irritation of the nearby organs such as the bladder or rectum. Uh, counter to this for surgery, um, the side effects include incontinence, so urinary incontinence. That will slowly improve uh, within the first year after surgery and erectile dysfunction, which both of those side effects occur immediately after surgery. And then they slowly improve and the erectile dysfunction can take up to two years to improve. So those are the treatment choices when the cancer is contained within the prostate. But if the cancer has spread beyond the prostate into the lymph nodes or bones or other organs, then the goal of treatment is to stop the cancer from spreading further or growing further. And surgery usually is no longer an option. And treatment involves a combination of treatments uh, between radiation, chemotherapy, and hormone therapy. Hormone therapy involves putting the man through a chemical castration. So cutting off the testosterone within the blood, which is what the cancer cells depend upon to grow. Um, and so it's essentially creates a male version of the menopause. Now here at, at Christiana Care, uh, we have a Helen F. Graham Cancer Center where we have a multidisciplinary team that we, uh, offer and multiple services that we can offer our patients. We see them as a team. The team includes myself who would represent urologic oncology. There's a radiation oncologist, there's a medical oncologist, there's a geneticist available, dietitians, specialty physical therapists who work with patients uh, before and after surgery to help recover from their urinary incontinence. We have social worker as well as supportive care and palliative care for those patients that have progressive metastatic disease. And all of this is coordinated with our nurse navigators who reach out to the patient and they coordinate their care and help make informed decisions. And pa patients really uh, have had nothing but positive things to say about our multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. They get to see all of their doctors in one shot. They, they get an uh, unbiased opinion because, you know, even as a surgeon, um, radiation oncologist, we have our inherent biases, but uh, we come up with a consensus management strategy for these patients. Um, and it's very well received. Additionally, Helen F. Graham Cancer Center is an NCI community designated uh, research program. So we have numerous clinical trials, which are at the cutting edge of um, medications and treatment options for men uh, that have suffered from prostate cancer. And it gives them an opportunity uh, to perhaps enroll in a clinical trial that's being carried out nationwide and receive some of the most advanced treatments. With that said, I want to say thank you and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Shah. There are lots of questions in the chat. Cool. Um, I will try and ask those. And then once we get okay. through those, um, if anybody else has a question, you can do the raise hand function and I will call on you. Um, the first question, and, and some of these you may have already answered, but you know, I want sure. to make sure that they get yeah. asked and you can expand upon them if you if you like. Absolutely. Um, does the patient have a shorter healing time after robotic surgery? Yes. Um, they typically spend just one night in the hospital. Uh, we get them up and walking the same evening after surgery, and they go home the first day after surgery. Uh, there are some institutions and doctors that are even sending the patient home immediately after surgery. So uh, before, when we used to do this open, patient would be in the hospital three to five days. They would have a lot of pain. Uh, they usually would be in bed for a few days. And so the, the robotic surgery has really minimized pain and has enhanced quicker recovery. That's, that's always a good thing. Um, next question. How are cancers found and diagnosed if some men with enlarged prostates are not bothered by their symptoms? So 
because the prostate cancer is screened with a rectal exam and a PSA, uh, that allows us to identify patients that may be harboring significant prostate cancer who otherwise have no symptoms from their BPH. And that's partly why it's very important based on your age and risk to talk to your doctor to see if you're appropriate for screening and consider having your blood test, the PSA test and have a rectal exam annually. Awesome. Um, how do these topics affect transgender people? Great question. So it depends on if they have retained all of their uh, male organs. And I'm gonna uh, address this by saying this mostly affects patients that are uh, male to female. And uh, I just saw a patient uh, a couple of days ago who transitioned from male to female, but still has uh, a prostate in place and is presenting with a lot of bothersome urinary symptoms. And so they should still you know, be mindful that they may have urinary symptoms related to an enlarged prostate or be at some risk of prostate cancer. Though if they have transitioned and they are castrate because their testicles have been removed and or in, they are on uh, estrogen replacement already and their testosterone is essentially negligible, then their PSA may very well be very low and their risk probably goes down for prostate cancer, but they may very well have BPH. Fascinating. Um, if you're a woman and your father had prostate cancer, does that mean you are more likely to have the BRCA, BRAC gene? Good question. Not necessarily, um, but that's why it's so important for our patients to know that they have genetic counseling available because it really, it helps their families. So if your father had prostate cancer and let's say they were very young, diagnosed in their 50s, 60s, they have siblings and or their father had prostate cancer, it may be very important for them to be evaluated for their, or their cancer to be evaluated for genetic mutations, and they may harbor BRCA gene, which in men would affect you. So kind of the same question in a different, in a flip, I guess, if breast cancer runs in the women in your family, but no one has had prostate cancer, is the man still considered at risk? Yes, they are. <laughs> Easy answer. I like it. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of people who are asking about men under the age of 40 not being advised to be screened for prostate cancer. Yep. Um, it's kind of like, well, why? And what if the person has issues? You know, is that the best way to catch anything early? Why wait before it's too late? Sure. I think the guidelines are general recommendations uh, and they're essentially guidance. It's, it's not an absolute. Every patient has to have a conversation on an individual level with their physician to see if something outside of what is quote unquote recommended would be appropriate in their case. With that said, broadly speaking, the benefit of screening men under 40 is very, very low in able to identify them early, even if they were harboring prostate cancer. Again, prostate cancer is very slow growing. So if you started screening them beyond 40, you're still highly likely to identify these men and treat them while the cancer is still localized. Uh, however, if they're having symptoms from their prostate, uh, then it may very well be more related to BPH. But regardless, they should have a conversation with their physician to see if it is indeed appropriate and or talk through why some of the risks of screening at that age may be too high. Next question, ooh, is, is an interesting one. Um, the questioner says, I noticed that some of your mRNA, <laughs> MRNA, MRI, MRI images have a grid superimposed on the picture. What kind of yeah. a coordinate system is used for precise placement of instruments, et cetera, inside the body? Uh, let me pull up that image. Where are we? So um, there is a, it, it, we have all of these views. So there's a three-dimensional view of the live ultrasound and it's a dynamic image. So you can see as you're rotating the images where your needle lines up relative to where the, the uh, 
nodule is. And so it's, um, I, I can't specifically comment on exactly uh, what sensitive or uh, what grid-like technique they use, but there's software that does this for us, which superimposes it. And we can see the trajectory of the needle relative to the lesion, and it makes it extremely accurate. And the way we have studied this in patients is men that have biopsies and then went on to have prostatectomies, we correlated the results of the biopsy to the final specimen and see what the cancer was in that area. And it has a very high correlation. And so it's very accurate. That's really cool. Um, next question. If a male child has many UTIs, does that make him, does that give him a higher risk in developing prostate issues, including cancer in the future? Uh, as far as we know, just having multiple UTIs does not increase your risk of prostate cancer. Um, it, it can cause prostatitis, which is infection or inflammation of the prostate gland. Um, and having frequent urinary tract infections um, as a younger adult could be secondary to and or lead to prostatitis. But when they're children, and I'm talking, you know, in their five, six, 10 years old, and they're getting urinary tract infections, the, the pathology for that may be very different um, and often may not have any bearing on their future risk of BPH and or prostate cancer at all. Good to know. Um, next question is, can prostate cancer spread to the rectum? Uh, it can if it, um, it, it grows locally. So the rectum is right uh, below or posterior to the prostate. And so if it's a locally advanced cancer, it can invade adjacent structures like the pro, uh, rectum. But that's stage four. So it's, it's much more advanced and we don't commonly see that. Catch it before it gets there. All right. Um, are there certain activities over the course of the years that can cause prostate cancer? Can this cause an issue with your sex life? So there is no correlation or environmental factors uh, or whether it's diet, exercise, um, exposures that we know that increase your risk of prostate cancer specifically. It's not like smoking and it's correlation with lung cancer. Uh, and therefore, there's no recommendation for avoiding any specific activity or diet. Um, of course, smoking is not good for you, so I would not recommend it, um, period. But uh, no, there is not a direct correlation there. So then, the, the, I guess the follow-up question is, can prostate cancer cause an issue with your sex life? Yeah. Uh, if, again, the nerves that control the erections run right outside the prostate, right next to it. And so if the cancer grows into those nerve bundles, it can cause erectile dysfunction. Now, treatment for prostate cancer often leads to erectile dysfunction. And that's because whether it's radiation that affects those nerves or you know scars those nerves or the surgery that disrupts those nerves, both of them lead to erectile dysfunction. So generally, often men that have prostate cancer end up with some degree of erectile dysfunction, usually secondary to the treatment, rarely due to local advancement of the cancer. Um, if you are on blood thinners, are you limited in surgical options for this type of thing? No, uh, you can still proceed with surgery. You just, under the guidance of your either the cardiologist who has you on the blood thinner or your primary doctor who manages your blood thinner will give us recommendations on how long we can safely hold the medication, but almost always we can hold it for a few days going into surgery and then for a few days after surgery. And that is usually all you would need. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions in the chat. Um, if anybody has any questions, if you wanna use the raise hand function, I can unmute you and you can ask away. I'll give it a couple minutes to make sure that we're all done with questions. Thank you, Dr. Shah, this was very interesting. My pleasure. Thank you guys yeah, for having me. Thank you, me. it was very good. Oh, here's one. Has there ever been a time when the whole prostate had to be removed? 
Great question. So for cancer, when we do surgery, we remove the whole prostate with the seminal vesicles and lymph nodes. But when we're talking about BPH, we don't need to take the whole prostate out and we just need to unobstruct the obstructing component or the central part of the prostate. And so in that case, we do not remove the whole prostate because the removal of the whole prostate, which is what we do for cancer, leads to the, or has the side effects of erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. And so, uh, well, we don't need to subject men to that for BPH. We don't need to take the whole prostate out. But for cancer, absolutely every time for surgery, we would take the whole prostate out. All right, I have a question in the chat. What does very slow growing mean? If a man skips two years of screenings but has a low risk of cancer, could it still be caught before it gets to, for example, stage three? Yeah, absolutely. Um, prostate cancer develops over years. And so uh, men typically, even when diagnosed, can have up to three, six months to elect for surgery. And, this is even if they have intermediate or high risk cancer. So in regards to screening, what we often do is if your several initial PSA tests are normal, we can spread out your screening to maybe every two years. And yet not you know, increase your risk of morbidity or mortality from the cancer at all. Uh, so I see in the chat that Jenna has a question. Jenna, let me find you and I will ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Give me a sec. I got to get down to the J's. All right, go ahead. And I think I asked you to unmute. Can you hear me, Kate? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. um, does prostate cancer spread to the rectum? Uh, good question. Only if it's not diagnosed early and it locally grows into the rectum. Mm -hmm. It's typically stage four by then it has invaded the rectum, but typically it won't spread there unless it grows into there. Okay. Thanks, Jenna. Um, is there any discoloring in the urine if they have had prostate cancer and have not been screened? Unfortunately, no. Testing the urine doesn't really give us an answer, especially now based on the color. There are some genomic testing that we can do on the urine to look for certain genetic mutations within the cells in the urine. Uh, and there's some new tests that can give us some idea of their risk for cancer, but uh, the color, no. That's unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> that would make, make life be so much easier. Yeah. Um, is there a holistic approach to treating prostate cancer? Great question. Unfortunately, there's no data to support uh, any herbal or natural remedies for this cancer. Um, I, there is some natural uh, medications or herbal meds that patients take for their enlarged prostates. And even that the data is mixed, there's really no obvious benefit, but some men report symptomatic relief and there's not much of a downside. So we don't usually discourage those patients to stop taking it. I don't re typically recommend it because there's, there's no evidence-based data to suggest that it works. And it certainly does not do anything for the cancer. So uh, I, I usually recommend against just doing holistic approaches. Now I'm, I'm completely supportive of a whole body approach and natural approaches where it's appropriate. And so if men or my patients that are interested in doing so, I try to encourage them to combine that with traditional medicine and treatments so that they can benefit from both. Unfortunately, we have a rare case where patients just do not want any traditional uh, treatment options. And in those cases, I've unfortunately seen the cancer grow and not really respond to anything natural or herbal. So this is a good spot for this question. There are various treatments. So what determines the, the treatment that you take for patients? Great question. It, so it boils down to uh, the patient's preferences. The cancer control between radiation and surgery 
is Alexa, equivalent. Cut off. Is equivalent Alexa. of ten years. Oh, hang on. Stop the get that. Alarm. Let me mute this. All right, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, the cancer control outcomes at ten years between radiation and surgery are the same, but their side effects are gravely different. So if patients are sicker or they absolutely don't want to have surgery because let's say they don't want urinary incontinence, even if it's temporary, uh, they may elect for radiation or they may say, I just want this out of my body and they will elect for surgery. And so we, we have a detailed conversation about the pros and cons of each. And then the patient ultimately typically selects what they think is best for them. With that said, um, we generally tend to favor surgery in younger, healthy patients. And our older patients that may be a little bit sicker tend to do better with radiation. Um, but even with that, that's not a absolute, you know, if you're above 70, you can only get radiation. Or if you're below 60, you only get surgery. It's a lot of uh, personalized medicine of what is best for you. Um, here's a good question. Is there any data currently um, about COVID and either prostate cancer or BPH? Uh, there is some data with regards to treatment related to the delay <laughs> secondary to COVID. Now, actually, there has been studies that show that men that even had high-risk cancers but then could not get their surgery because of COVID and had to wait up to six months, that it's safe. Uh, but with regards to COVID and direct correlation leading to BPH or prostate cancer, we do not have any data there. And I think it's a little too early, um, frankly. All right. Um, how does bladder cancer affect the prostate? Uh, good question. So typically bladder cancer, if it's superficial, as in, in the early stages, it has no effect on the prostate. Rarely you get some bladder cancers that are advanced uh, and grow into the prostate and that can happen. And rarely the prostate cancers can grow into the bladder. And so again, those are all advanced cancers, but as a general rule, super early stage bladder cancer does not affect the prostate at all. All right, uh, Rhonda, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead and unmute. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is more, let me see if this is a question or not. Sometime, um, I don't know if you're a diabetic, you can suffer from erectile dysfunction. Uh, but if you're in that age bracket where you should get your prostate checked, um, I guess I'm asking, is that what you should do? Because, you know, I know someone who's going through that right now. Yes. Regardless of your medical conditions, uh, if you are in the appropriate age group, which is 55 to at least, you know, 69, you should have a conversation with your physician about getting screened. Uh, just having diabetes or erectile dysfunction or high blood pressure or cholesterol or even other cancers does not preclude you from the benefits of potential treatment for prostate cancer if you're overall doing well. So uh, you should be screened. So here's a question, and if you don't know, it's okay, because I don't know that this is in your wheelhouse, but do women experience any difficulties with urination as they reach an advanced age? If so, what might be the cause of that? A man asked that question for all my ladies. Sure. So, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, certainly women get uh, issues with urination as they get older. Uh, some women will experience what we call pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, and a lot of that is secondary to prior childbearing. This is where things can sort of fall, fall out or fall down. That can lead to difficulty with emptying your bladder or can lead to leakage. A lot of women after childbirth can have stress urinary incontinence or when they cough or sneeze or pick up something heavy, a few drops of urine sneak out or leak. They may also have uh, their bladders can get sort of fatigued or tired and they may not be able to hold as much urine so they go more frequently or have to rush or sometimes older patients especially women can start to get urinary tract infections and that's because the female urethra is very short there's bacteria that normally live in the vaginal canal but as 
women go through menopause, those bacteria, uh, the estrogen levels in the vagina decrease and the healthy bacteria can sometimes be replaced by pathologic bacteria, which then find easy access to get into the bladder through the short urethra. And some women are more prone to infections. So absolutely, women have their own very different uh, urinary tract issues. Um, someone in the chat said that they had previously been diagnosed with prostate cancer and also developed bilateral DVTs. His doctor could not determine the etiology, but said there was a study that prostate cancer can cause DVTs. Yeah. Like uh, yeah, sure. Good question. Uh, any cancer uh, is a risk factor for developing blood clots, which is DVT or deep vein, deep venous thrombosis in your legs. Um, typically prostate cancer, if you're having surgery, you're at a slightly higher risk because of the anesthesia, the immobility, as well as the cancer itself. So yes, any cancer, not just prostate, is a risk factor for developing blood clots in your legs. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Any other questions? I don't see any. All righty. Dr. Shah, thank you so very much uh, for coming and presenting uh, this evening. Uh, folks, Absolutely. next week we have uh, Brett Sansbury, uh, who's with the Gene Editing Institute. He's going to be talking about CRISPR and gene editing, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Uh, Dr. Gibbs, can I just say something really sure. quick? For anybody that uh, may want to reach me, just so you guys know, I see patients on three Three, I have three offices, one in Chad's Ford, uh, one in Wilmington, and one in Newark. And so um, Dr. Gibbs or Dr. Smith can give you guys my contact if you're looking to reach me and our phone number or email. And feel free to reach out, no matter whether it's for you, your loved ones, or you just have a question, I'd be more than happy to, to answer any of those if they come up later. At all and I can put my information personal. in the chat. I'll, I'll add to that a personal testimony that uh, I might be a patient of our presenter this evening, and he's a fantastic uh, 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 physician. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.